It's crucial in Buddhism for us to have uh, a female ordination because the, uh, the path of the fully ordained monastic is the path that's available for people who want to devote their life to the spiritual practice of the Dhamma. Uh, and it, within the Buddhist community, that's considered to be a very, uh, very exalted and very honourable vocation uh, that people can have the opportunity to choose so that they can fully devote themselves to their spiritual practice and and so that they can receive the support of the community to do that. Currently, in some Buddhist countries, that option is only available to men. Uh, and so we have been trying to change this so that the option to ordain is equally available to women in all Buddhist cultures. Yes, I was very uh, inspired uh, and excited to hear about this project of doing a documentary on the female masters of spirituality uh, because it's crucial that we see uh, what women are doing, uh, that we not just uh, uh, read about it in books or talk about it, but that we see what the, the spiritual practitioners are doing within Buddhism. We see how they're living their lives and we see how they're changing uh, the way that Buddhism is and the way it's perceived. Uh, and unless we can provide an opportunity for the female practitioners to speak with their own voice, uh, then we are just hearing the, the narrative, we're just hearing the story uh, as told from the perspective of the monks. Uh, and for too long in Buddhism, that's been the only voice that we've heard. And uh, so it's a very refreshing and very important change to be able to hear the voice of the nuns uh, to, to articulate uh, their own understanding and their own practice. project like this, like the, the, the Female Masters of Spirituality documentary, uh, will raise awareness and raise consciousness of people about what is happening. Uh, and as long as we don't uh, see what people are doing and how they're living, and as long as we don't see what's possible for female spiritual practitioners, uh, then we, we simply won't be able to, to put our support behind it. Uh, so this is like a first step. Uh, which, is, which is there to, to make it possible for women to uh, practice in a way that has equality and has dignity and has respect. One of the things which is very uh, noticeable, certainly in Buddhism and I think in spiritual traditions generally, uh, is how many women there are. And if we run the meditation retreat or hold talks and all of these kinds of spiritual activities uh, all around the world, uh, it's, it's almost always, it's, it's mostly women who attend. Uh, and so there's an incredible vitality and interest in women for that spiritual practice. Uh, as long as we are not responding to that and not uh, giving the women the respect that they deserve to be able to practice fully, then we're missing out on all of the contributions that they can be making. In a country like Taiwan, for example, where women have been supported to become bhikkhunis, uh, they're running uh, universities and colleges, they're, they are taking responsibility, they're playing an important part in Dhamma education, but also in the life of the community, uh, in running retreats and teachings, uh, in, uh, in advocating for social change and obviously especially in advocating for changes for the protection of women. Uh, and so these are kinds of things which uh, the uh, female community uh, is going to do in many ways a lot better than the monks have been able to do. According to the Buddhist tradition, uh, in the Theravadan countries, that's, that's in the, the southern countries of Buddhism, uh, there was a bhikkhuni tradition up until about a thousand years or so ago. Uh, at that point, there's no further mentions of the bhikkhunis uh, and it's assumed that because there was a lot of uh, war and social unrest at the time, uh, that, that somehow the bhikkhuni monasteries were destroyed or, or, or they passed away. There wasn't the, the ability for them to sustain as an institution. So since that time, there are occasional mentions of bhikkhunis in historical records, but there's no real, um, there's no real evidence for a continuous uh, presence of bhikkhunis in the Theravadan country since that time.
that I go, I see that there are a lot of women who are interested in spiritual practice. Uh, we've just come from uh, a retreat, uh, and you know, we can see that on the retreat there are many people, many women there, uh, interested in meditation. And that shows us that the, the traditional forms and the available forms of spirituality and spiritual practice are not meeting the needs for all women. Uh, there is something very powerful and very alluring about the idea of enlightenment and about the idea of a life which is dedicated towards a practice for, for enlightenment. And uh, my, my feeling is that if this is available, that no matter what country we're in in the world, that we will find that there are women who are interested and who will uh, find spiritual uh, nourishment and, and fulfillment uh, through that practice. One of the things which is offered in the Buddhist tradition is the chance for lay people to come and spend time in a monastery to do meditation, to listen to teachings, and sometimes just to spend some peaceful time away from the, the cares of your life. Uh, and in m most monasteries around the world, uh, of course, it's, it's easy for men to do that. In many places, there are also opportunities for lay women to come and practice, uh, but typically it's a bit harder to come by, and the women sort of tend to be kind of shunted off to one corner of the monastery where you prefer to ignore them except at the mealtime where they come and give you lots of lovely food, and that's, that's all very good. And uh, so... Uh, it makes it a lot harder for women to get access to teachings. Uh, it especially makes it harder for them to ask questions about things that might be personal or uh, about you know, relationship issues and all kinds of things that they might not feel comfortable about talking about with a monk. Uh, and so these are, these are kinds of problems which, um, you know, from my point of view as a monk, it's very easy to overlook this, right? To, to not, to not realise how important it is. Uh, but within, uh, within a Buddhist community, uh, the, 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 the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, they provide like a, 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 an oasis or a sounding board or a place of like, almost like a well that you can go to and, and, and find wisdom, find a time for reflection uh, and find, find a, 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 some help to, to manage through the difficulties of life. And when there are women who are living that role, uh, then they can do that in very important ways that men are not able to do. You know, and, and particularly, I've mentioned, in cases of things like uh, domestic violence, uh, rape, uh, child abuse, uh, these kinds of issues where uh, women suffer far more than men do. And uh, it's difficult to find uh, a monk or a man to talk to about these things in a way that they can listen to and that can be helpful. Reality is that uh, Buddhist cultures, like any other cultures, uh, are not always very Buddhist. And uh, it's very helpful to make a distinction between what is Dharma, right? what is the truth, the reality that the Buddha was teaching about, uh, and what is Buddhism, so what's, what's actually practiced in Buddhist cultures. Uh, and you know, just as in a, in a Christian culture there are many things going on which Jesus would probably be horrified at, uh, the same way in Buddhist cultures there are many things happening which the Buddha uh, was not teaching and which are quite contrary to the Buddha's teachings. So that's just humanity. People are like that. They're not perfect. Perfect. And so when we're practicing Buddhism, uh, it's, Im it's important, absolutely crucial for us to uh, keep our own sense of what is right and what is wrong. Okay? Don't give up what's right and what is wrong and don't, don't, don't disparage those things that you've learnt uh, uh, and think that you have to sort of renounce all those things to become a Buddhist. This, this is not the case. Buddhism should be enhancing, if it's practiced properly, Buddhism should be enhancing and deepening your sense of what's right and what's wrong. Uh, and so uh, when we're going to Buddhist countries, we distinguish between things which are Dhamma, which are really good and really worthwhile, and then things which uh, are found in the culture and, and which are not necessarily uh, uh, part of really what, what Dhamma practice is about. The good news is that in Buddhism, is, is even though it is 
very patriarchal in the sense of the, the, the structure of the monastic community, uh, but at the same time it's not, it's not so much a power-based patriarchy. There's still quite a lot of freedom for individuals to practice uh, as they wish in different kinds of monasteries. Uh, and so even though, yes, we can talk on a, on a structural level that there are these problems in the institutions, but it is still quite possible to find many places where you can practice happily and be respected and supported for your practice. Within the Buddhist community, uh, there is a, a, a fine balance between the monastic community and the lay community. And even though the monastic community is providing spiritual leadership, and they seem to be the ones who say what's going on, the reality is that uh, the lay people are the ones who feed them every day. And if the monks don't eat, all right, they are going to find that their timeless traditions can be changed more quickly than they thought that was possible. Yeah? It's crucial, it's so important for women to support other women. This is the, the, the most single thing. Support the bikinis, not just for women to support the bikinis, everyone should, but especially for women. You need to support the bikinis, you need to support women who are doing their spiritual practice, no matter where or in what capacity they're doing it. Uh, and uh, pe people in, in, in the Buddhist community need to know that it's okay it's not the end of the world. Right? Nothing bad is going to come from it. There are bhikkhunis in many, many Buddhist countries now, and nothing bad has happened. Okay? All it means is that there are women's communities of people who are meditating and doing good things, helping the community and living a good life. That's all. Uh, so there's nothing to be afraid of. And so uh, every uh, uh, through the practice of generosity, uh, of kindness, of giving and supporting, speaking out, in favour of bikinis and uh, doing what you can to help, uh, then these things are what's going to be, make it possible for the bikinis communities to flourish in the future. The Buddhist monastic community was established by the Buddha in the Buddha's lifetime, and that includes bhikkhunis. Uh, and the bhikkhuni uh, sangha is one of the world's oldest uh, continuous spiritual traditions and the Buddhist uh, texts contain what's possibly the oldest book uh, spoken in women's voices about their own spiritual experiences right, dating from around 500 BC. So uh, that was an intrinsic part of the early Buddhist community. So much so that the Buddha said that that was his mission. When he began to teach the Dhamma, he said, I will not die until I have established the fourfold community. And that fourfold community is the, the monks and nuns and the lay people, lay, lay men and lay women. So that four, four aspects of the community that must be established before the Buddha's life's work is complete. Not only that, uh, it's not only that there, there have to be those four communities, but that each of those four communities must be uh, widespread and popular and they must be well established and they must have people in them who are learned and expert and capable of teaching the Dhamma. And so, so from the earliest times, it wasn't merely the fact that the bhikkhunis were present, but the fact that they were active in teaching and propagating the Dhamma, and that this was considered by the Buddha to be an essential part of establishing uh, his dispensation. the stories that people bring up all the time in the context of bhikkhunis is the story of the ordination of the Buddha's uh, auntie Mahapajapati, which is supposedly the st how the bhikkhuni order came to be. Now in fact, uh, as a historical and text critical scholar, uh, I've done a lot of research into this story as have many other scholars and all of the scholars of research that have concluded that this story is not an authentic story. This is not what actually happened. Uh, and in fact, if you look at it closely, it's obvious that this is the case, okay? So what did actually happen? Well, according to the story, 
given in the traditions when the Buddha's auntie uh, came to the uh, came to the Buddha and asked to ordain as a nun uh, the Buddha refused her three times uh, and then laid down a list of rules called the eight Garudamas uh, for uh, for her to keep as a condition of her ordination and that's how the uh, Bikuni order became came to be established and in fact in the passage it, it gives a, a rather terrifying series of similes like that that ordination of women will be like a, a plague of uh, a, a, that's going to destroy the crops, right? the, the disease of uh, red rot that's going to destroy the sugar cane, or like a flood that's going to wipe out the cities. Okay, now these are very powerful images, very emotional images, right? And uh, as a rule, uh, the Buddha was not prone to saying this kind of thing, especially when there wasn't any reason to say it. Uh, so what, what actually happened? Well, that's very hard for us to say. It was two and a half thousand years ago. My own conclusions based on the research into that was that that story is a sort of garbled memory of the ordination of the Buddha's auntie who was uh, like many members of the Buddha's family, okay, was a bit problematic because she was very proud of her son. Okay, so the Buddha's auntie or stepmother, she raised him as a child, she looked on him, him as her son. So uh, she was very proud of him. The same thing is said of the, of the Buddha's own son and of other members of the Buddha's family and so on. This is a normal feature of all of the stories about the Buddha's family, right? They, they caused problems in the Sangha because they were very proud of their relationship with the Buddha. So I suspect that what happened was that when she came to ordain, uh, the Buddha was a bit cautious about her ordaining because of her very proud attitude and wanted to make sure that she would properly respect the Sangha when she ordained. I don't think she was the first bhikkhuni and I don't think Think that the Buddha uh, meant that those rules and so on should apply to all bhikkhunis. I think they, he, she, he meant them to apply to specifically to his stepmother to show that she wasn't getting any special treatment or favoritism. I think the first bhikkhuni uh, possibly was a woman called Bhada Kundalakesa uh, who when she came to uh, ordain the Buddha said come Bhada and gave her the full ordination straight away and uh, there are many indications in the texts that uh, the uh, Mahapajapati was not in fact the first of the nuns. It's really important when, when presenting the narrative of the bhikkhunis not to focus too much on that story because that's the story that the patriarchs will bring up again and again and again. Like it's okay to address it but it needs to be in a context. The thing that people forget is that the, the, the most, by far the most important statement on bhikkhunis in the early text is the terigata, terigata which is the voices of the bhikkhunis themselves. So if we want to promote uh, the bhikkhunis, then I'd much, be much happier talking about the terigata, which is actually where you present the voices of the bhikkhunis and see what they have to say. And that gives a very strong and very positive and much more re historically realistic position, uh, rather than focusing too much on the Mahapajapati story, which is, like I said, historically dubious and and notice that that's reactive, okay? So that's, that's the crit critiques that happen. So you're, you're buying in to the patriarch's narrative by responding to that way, okay? Right? So we have to be conscious of that. And, and so this is why I said that it's okay to talk about it, but we should be careful to put the bhikkhuni's own voices foremost. So we, we, don't, we don't engage in, in the patriarch's narrative, we create a new narrative, right? And put the, put the voices of the women you know, in the center place, which is where they really belong. Yeah. So there's, there's a list of rules called the eight Garudamas or the eight rules of respect which uh, uh, the, according to the Buddhist disciplinary texts uh, is supposed to have been uh, imposed on the bhikkhunis. These eight Garudamas are sexist and they require that the, that the nuns you know, bow to all of the monks and that they can't speak in front of the monks and these kinds of things. This is just the ordinary standard ways that the patriarchy silences women and makes them inferior. Uh, it's important to notice, however, that the Garudamas do not provide any power of command. 
nor does anywhere in the vinaya provide a power of command or a duty of obedience on the part of women. And this is an important uh, uh, revolution in the relationship between men and women and one which is not, uh, not noticed often enough. Okay? Monks have no right to order a nun to do anything. Okay? None whatsoever. However, there is that, that relationship through kind of the, the deference and the silence as imposed by the Garudamas, which does uh, diminish the role of nuns and, uh, uh, within the community. And these Garudamas were uh, not authentic, they're not a part of what the Buddha taught, and they were introduced into the Buddhist tradition perhaps one or two hundred years after the Buddha died, uh, during a time when uh, those kinds of attitudes were becoming prominent uh, in the Sangha and the, the texts were rewritten to incorporate uh, these kinds of uh, uh, ideas and attitudes. Okay, so yes, so, so this, this is a change, perhaps a, a revolution in the way that Buddhism is practiced in the Theravadan countries. Uh, the prominence and the changes in the, in the role of women has been something which has been debated in the Theravadan countries for the period of what we call Buddhist modernism, at, at least that, so at least the 19th century. Uh, for example, in the 1920s, there were, in late 1920s, early 1930s, uh, there was an attempt in Thailand to, to revive the bhikkhuni order. Uh, a manuscript from Burma from around the same time uh, says that there was a lot of discussion among the, the, the monks about the, the question of bhikkhuni ordination at that time. So it's been going on for a long while. Uh, but it wasn't until uh, the 1990s that we had the first really successful series of bhikkhuni ordinations which provided the foundation for the uh, re-establishment of the bhikkhuni order uh, in India, uh, Sri Lanka uh, and Thailand which has subsequently spread to other countries. Uh, so I, why did it happen then? Well I guess probably just um, we were ready for it. I guess there was a greater awareness of Buddhism internationally more of a, a sort of a consciousness of uh, who we were as a Buddhist community, not just like in, a, in, in each of our local spaces, um, more of an awareness of the connection between different traditions of Buddhism, which allowed the sort of cross-fertilization of ideas. Uh, and I guess also it probably depended on uh, having the right people at the right time, you know, having the people who had the guts and the uh, intelligence and the dedication uh, to go through with it. Equality is one of the fundamental virtues of Buddhism. When we look at the, uh, the basic statements of the Buddha on things like um, loving kindness, right? may, may all beings be happy, right? it's not making a distinction. Right? There's, no, there's no kind of favoritism, may my tribe be happy or may people of my race or my skin color or whatever be happy and, and not others. Right? This kind of thinking is completely, completely foreign to, to the Buddha and to the, how, the way that he uh, taught. And he, he made it so central in his teachings that he was teaching only in order to help people to, to remove their suffering. That's all. And so if we start imposing these kinds of um, uh, distinctions and divisions and discriminations, we're no longer responding to the central message of Buddhism. We've, we've lost the heart of the Dhamma. Uh, and it's no uh, coincidence that in Sri Lanka, when they began the bhikkhuni ordinations, the monk who was the most supportive of the bhikkhuni ordinations was a, a monk who previously had done ordinations outside of the caste system. Okay? In Sri Lanka, most ordinations happen within a caste system, which is crazy from a Buddhist point of view. The Buddha was totally opposed to the caste system, and yet this is how the ordinations are done today. So this here was a monk who understood this and who defied uh, his own uh, tradition uh, to do ordination in the way that the Buddha wanted without reference to caste. And that same monk then went on to support uh, the bhikkhuni ordination for the same reason. It's, it's, it's the same principles of equality and non-discrimination which lie at the heart of the Buddha's message.
Well, I'd, I'd like to see. I'd like to go to to see in the in the Bikuni monasteries and see what the, what they're actually doing. You know, and to sort of focus on the life of the nuns, how they how they live together, how they work together. You know, what their practice is and so on. It would also be interesting to see um, their right. The, 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 like so. So first of all, in the, the sort of inner practice, like what they do individually, the meditation and study, but also their community, right? How they work with the community. But also in terms of their relationship with the wider community, like to see the nuns in the role of being teachers, uh, performing like rituals and services for, for, for the lay community and so on, that would, that would be something that's very interesting. Yeah. I'm not sure if I mentioned this to you, but uh, some, some years ago I, I asked a friend of mine in, in India, a Sri Lankan monk, um, I said, how's Buddhism going in Sri Lanka, right? And he said, oh, pretty bad. He said, he said, all the monks are disrobing and stuff. He said, but the bhikkhunis are going well. And I said, you know, I said, you know, how, how are people, how, how does the community um, responding to the bhikkhuni order? And he said, well, he said, to be honest, a lot of the lay people now uh, prefer to invite the bhikkhunis to come to their house to do, uh, offer dana and do chanting and so on, um, because they can see that the, the bhikkhunis are practicing much better than the bhikkhus are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know that, that that that's a really interesting shift, right? And so that would be you know really nice to see actually how that's happening within the communities, like going into the houses, because that's again that's something that that people in someone like Poland don't really see, right? You don't see you you, you maybe have like an image of a Buddhist monk or nun on a hilltop meditating in the forest, right? And that's a true image. It, it happens and it's great, right? But it's also true that they're there in the villages. They're there when somebody loses their child, yeah. In, childbirth or something like that and they're there at the funeral of the grandmother of the family that they've lived next to for their whole life you know and they're there in, in all of these moments that really mean things in people's lives so that would be a really nice thing to be just to see So one of the things which, if when we do, when we talk about the the patriarchy in Buddhism, it's easy to overlook the fact that uh, the the historical reality was that there was a, an energetic, vital, and thriving women spiritual community within all schools of Buddhism from the time of the founding of the Dhamma uh, by the Buddha himself, uh, and that women's community produced. The Terigata, which is possibly the oldest collection of uh, women's spiritual teachings uh, in existence, uh, as well as a number of other uh, interesting and important uh, statements from the women themselves. And uh, we know that uh, in the history of Buddhism through India that the bhikkhunis were very prominent. They are mentioned in inscriptions and, uh, and dedications and in the archaeological remains about the same number of times as the monks are. And they're also mentioned in the same roles as the monks are, as roles as teachers, as memorizers of the scriptures, as, as organizers of large groups of lay people with large followings uh, who were uh, uh, prominent in sponsoring, for example, the building of stupas and monuments and things like this. So they clearly played a, a vital and prominent role within Indian Buddhism uh, for all of that time. Uh, and of course that continues to be the, the case in those Buddhist countries that do have bhikkhuni orders, that is in the East Asian countries of Taiwan, Korea, uh, Vietnam, uh, China, uh, where the bhikkhunis are strong and uh, are a gr great contribution to Buddhism in those countries. Uh, so it's unfortunate that that has not been the case in Theravada countries in the more recent centuries uh, and I think that it's one of the essential uh, features of a new Buddhism, a more vital world Buddhism, if we're going to create such a thing, uh, that we're able to recapture that energy and that vitality which women practitioners can bring to the Dhamma. Was the Buddha a feminist? Sure, why not? Yeah? I mean, the Buddha was somebody who tried to overcome suffering and uh, uh, discrimination against women is something that causes suffering. You know, it's very simple. And so uh, uh, 
if, you're, if you recognize, right, if you look at the Four Noble Truths, first of all is to recognize the suffering. Right? So did, was the Buddha aware of the special kinds of suffering which women were likely to face? Yes, yes he was. Yeah? And there are many passages in the early texts where the Buddha uh, recognized that women are, are subject to special kinds of suffering and he put into place rules or teachings that would express that and try to mitigate that. Uh, for example, uh, he uh, said that uh, women, uh, nuns, are much less uh, well supported, much less likely to receive alms food than the monks were. Uh, and so for that reason that the nuns uh, shouldn't uh, feel obligated to give their food to the monks and made a rule against that to make sure that the nuns had enough to eat. Uh, so he not only recognized the special suffering that the women faced, uh, but also he uh, uh, thought that it was important to put into place uh, social structures that would try to mitigate that, that would try to provide protection for women and try to uh, stop them from, uh, from being discriminated. And so to me, these are, this is the foundation, that's, that's, all, that's all that feminism is. It's a recognition that this suffering exists and that we have a duty to try to do something to overcome it. Uh, and so for that reason, I have you know, no hesitation uh, in saying that the Buddha was a feminist. Uh, am I a feminist? Yes, I'm very proud to call myself a feminist, yeah. I'm not sure if feminists are proud to have me, but whatever, that's their choice. Uh, but yeah, for, for exactly for that same reason, you know. One thing I think it's important to recognise is that the opposite of feminism is not nothing. Yeah? Yeah, the opposite, <laughs> it's just as much effort to be sexist as it is to be feminist, right? And so feminism is just a way of looking at the world uh, which recognises uh, those blanks and those distortions in our mind that come when we have been conditioned from these sexist points of view. Right? So once we start to question that and to try to see, well, actually there is another way of looking, another way of seeing, uh, then we realise that, that, that uh, what we thought was just natural, right? We think it's just natural to see the thing, world in this way, but in fact, it's a very carefully constructed, carefully constructed uh, 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 sort of cultural situation which enables the patriarchy. I'll just give one, one example of that that I noticed a little while ago. I was doing some research into Buddhist texts and whether I could translate in a, in a non-gendered way. And uh, of course in English you have a default masculine gender and if you, there are forms you can use in English which uh, are, are ungendered but they're kind of looked down on by the grammatical specialist. But the interesting thing was that historically that those gender free forms were actually quite popular and are found in old forms of English and were disparaged by male grammarians and writers of dictionaries. The men were controlling the universities, they were controlling the journals, they were controlling what's right and what's wrong in language. So to use the masculine pronoun in English, it's not somehow natural or, or inevitable, it's a patriarchal construction. And uh, so, you know, this is just one of the, you know, many, many, many uh, uh, instances of this happening. So for me, you know, the, the, the feminism is not, uh, uh, is not something which is really kind of optional, you know, I think it's it's, it's crucial that we all be feminists and that we all recognize that uh, a commitment to equality should be part of our spiritual practice.